Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, welcome to the Benchmark EIG Masterclass webinar series. It's hosted by Benchmark PhD, and we are very, very excited. Uh, a little bit of context to our Masterclass today. Uh, when we got talking to experts like yourself and identified a large gap in the understanding of ESG in the community, as well as the very complex landscape that accompanies it. This is when we felt that the need of the hour was a comprehensive ESG masterclass that would get to the heart of the matter and really serve this community's needs, diving into the key aspects of ESG, as well as the questions and buzzwords associated with it. To add value to our masterclass series, we've introduced a certificate program at the end of March, we will issue a certificate to all participants who have attended all five parts of the webinar series. And uh, we're really looking forward to seeing you all continue with us on this journey. I'm Alicia Watt. I'm a business development specialist at Benchmark ESG Private Limited. And I'm also your masterclass coordinator for today. So over two decades now, Benchmark ESG's cloud-based digital EHS in ESG platform has helped businesses manage safe and sustainable operations worldwide and digitally transform their environmental health, safety, sustainability, supplier and product stewardship program under the larger umbrella of ESG. With this context, we welcome you to part one of our ESG Masterclass series, where we look at the evolution of ESG and dive into some key aspects of ESG, as well as set the foundation for the parts to follow. We are very fortunate today to have with us Mr. Shankar Rajagopalan. He is a ESG expert and masterclass lead. Um, just a moment. Hello. 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 Hello, everybody. Yeah, he's an ESG expert as well as a masterclass lead for the day. And uh, Shankar is an environment, health, safety, quality, and sustainability expert. And he has more than 36 years of experience in the domain. He is currently an ESG consultant who has extensive experience working as the previous ESG head at Granules India Limited and in EHS and sustainability roles at Dr. Reddy's, Pfizer, Tata Projects, and Sterling Investments. Also joining us today are our in house digital ESG experts. We have Chadran Tiwari as well as Ayush Vidyadharan with us. Chandan is currently the Associate Director, APAC Subscriber Development at Benchmark ESG Private Limited. He is a qualified EHS in sustainability practitioner with 13 years of experience in digital transformation, business integration, occupational health, safety, environment, and ESG management system implementation. Welcome, Chandan. We also have with us Ayush. Ayush is a lead subscriber development and engagement specialist at Benchmark ESG. He is a mechanical engineer by profession, and he holds a master's in EHS. He has experience working with ports and logistics, then manufacturing from prior to joining Benchmark. Ayush is today a GRI team sustainability professional with expertise in GRI, the GHG protocol, as well as ERS. Benchmark ESG is hosting this webinar in collaboration with Bangalore Chamber of Industry and Commerce. Before we proceed, here is a quick look at the five parts that we have lined up for you across the following months. Now, uh, today we're on part one, where we're navigating the ESG ecosystem and building the foundation for ESG. In part two, we we'll look at the environmental pillar of ESG. In part three, the social pillar. And in part four, the governance pillar, as well as we'll go ahead and decode the in decode investment in ESG data. And in part five, we'll help you put it all together and show you how you can digitally transform your ESG program and report ESG data. Now, as we discussed, if you get through all five parts, we will issue you with a certificate, the Benchmark ESG Masterclass Certificate. Uh, before we proceed, and I hand over to Shankar, uh, some quick housekeeping rules. Um, so we are very eager to listen to your questions so, and your comments as well. Uh, please go ahead and add any questions you have in the chat box, and we'll have our experts answer right away. And we'll also take up a few questions in the question and answer segment that we have at the end of the session. Uh, Shankar, over to you from here. Thank you so much, Elisa, for getting us together. And for 
the small introductions. Yeah. Wonderful to be with a great audience here today and wonderful to be there. Alicia, let enable screen sharing. So friends, navigating the ESG ecosystem and uh, building the foundation for the ESG program is what you are. Yeah, that's where you are here today. And uh, this is the first of the series. At least I have to stop sharing so that I can start sharing. Yes, one second. Wonderful. Super. So thank you so much, friends. It's been uh, and a good day to everybody. Uh, this is a very exciting uh, recipe we have for the first part of the series. And this is the beginning of a program which will take you through and end up perhaps over the next quarter. One of the questions that I was asked in one of the last interviews was, and I said that I got some 37 years of experience, got some 25 years of experience in ESG. And they said, are you certified? I said, I had a GRI certified, uh, you know, kind of all the standards across the last uh, 10 years. But they said, are you still you certified to ESG? So I guess the first time you're getting a certified program to ESG and wonderful to see uh, a lot of people who are nom nominated and hope all of them will join. So friends today, uh, for all of you in various roles that you play across, I guess all of you are change agents, right? And how do you manage change? So this agenda on ESG building the foundation is also a little bit about navigating change. So how then, how then do you begin change and this initiative that we all must be driving uh, today, as you say, it's World Quality Day, but we're talking of ESG, which is pretty overarching. How do you drive change? You begin by making a case for change, right? That's how you begin. And that's about the uh, basics of making a business case. And then you enlist the stakeholders, develop a shared vision, try and see things from a perspective of all the stakeholders. And after you do that, you also communicate the vision and there would be challenges, there would be barriers, the way you would remove the barriers, the way you would mitigate the risk there. And then of course, set tools, set milestones to acknowledge progress and reinforce the change. So friends, ESG is no different. It is actually the mother of all interventions. And what I'm gonna take you through the next uh, 40 minutes is about all of these, right? So. I guess we say that if you don't know where we're coming from, we won't know where to go. So we'll begin with the uh, overview. We'll have a roadmap on the history of evolution of uh, ESG. We'll also give you a context to uh, the landscape of ESG in the region and why. And I think when we begin, whenever we begin an implementation, the first question that comes in is why do you want to do what you do? And we explain the value of ESG. This ESG pillars is something that all of us have heard of and it is trending, but not all of us know as much. This uh, title of expert is something that is very uh, daunting for all of us, be it digital or ESG experts. And with all my experience, I feel scared. It's like a sword of democles that hangs over our head. We are all learning in this journey, but I guess it's also about learning from how we build the pillars and how we understand and interpret this in our own ways. In some ways, we're all like this three blind men looking at the elephant. All of us seeing a different part of it and all of them are right, but I guess that's the elephant that we want to uh, demystify today. How do we really build your program? And that's where we'll try and give you the overall context. Uh, also explain how we can uh, remove the barriers, how we can power the uh, way of managing the program through digital tools. So that's the overall agenda for today. If you're good to go, let's begin with understanding ESG as an overview. So what's ESG? Simply put, it's the environmental, social, and governance, right? So these are the three, uh, you can say the pillars. The environmental is also called the uh, <clears throat> planet. The social is called the people and the governance is also tagged as the profits or prosperity if you look at it more holistically. So environment largely looks at the climate change strategy. And I think uh, if you notice the conference of parties at Egypt, as we began this week, the other action that is uh, competing with the masterclass for attention is talking of all of these, biodiversity, water efficiency, energy efficiency, carbon intensity, and of course the environmental management systems. And the most important bottom line I would say is about the people. We talk of the people, uh, the health and safety of people, equal opportunities, freedom of association, human rights, of course, which sometimes they can say is a given and hygiene, but that's the one that normally doesn't get addressed so much. The governance, and you might think, what do we do? What role do we have to play in governance? It's about ethics and compliance. It's about how we manage, how we govern. It all begins with the leadership, right? In the words of Maseki Mai, uh, the three elements of change for uh, any intervention is top management commitment, 
ditto ditto and i guess that's where it starts and that's where it ends the central question friends and that's the question that would be asked is how does an organization manage risks and opportunities related to esg and i guess that comes back to identifying and understanding of stakeholders uh, who is the stakeholder then you you know where this journey began and today being quality day it all began with the isos that is 9000 on the quality management system and standard that says the stakeholders are the interested parties who are essentially the stakeholders who are the individual or groups affected by the organization's activities the stakeholders uh, provide significant risk to the organization's sustainability if their needs and expectations are not met needs and expectations also translates and connects well with what they call materiality in the esg terminology so i guess all these lexicons talk to each other there's a nice interoperability between esg and all the other platforms system that you're talking of here so again this is about managing as we said in the pandemic we heard a lot of companies having risks but every risk also gives an opportunity which again is the term that comes up so this is the triple bottle man friends the environmental social and governance the governance largely talks about the uh, going beyond profits to the prosperity looking at how the company looks at uh, you know return on investment and that's something that obviously would be the most critical element for sustenance the social pillars over the people you can't do a business harming uh, people affecting the stakeholders the value chain the uh, workforce and also you got to encourage people to uh, uh, got to be a great place to work and of course the environmental part of it is the planet and you can't and the entire journey is about the planet you got to ensure that uh, you don't have dam damage the planet so this the triple bottom line is what we talk of esg and uh, the question that comes about risk and opportunities related to esg comes in from a various stakeholders so it's a very inclusive approach that takes us through this journey out here right friends so let's also talk then about the <clears throat> evolution and landscape of uh, esg in our region which is the apac and middle east region which is largely where a lot of our uh, Uh, audience today is from and let's talk a little bit about the uh, nature of what's happening there but let's begin with the evolution of esg where it began what's the journey across so it all began sometimes in the 1980s and there are terms that sometimes are used interchangeably esg csr and of course ehs and there's again an attempt to try and explain this to you in a manner that uh, sticks so in the 80s it largely began with ehs it was based on the development of environmental and employee regulations so it all began with compliance expectations and regulations the definition of sustainability actually came in in the around the 1990s uh, it was actually coined in at the end of 80s by the un uh, brundtland commission uh, that said sustainability is about meeting the needs of the present without compromising on the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs so this is where it began if you remember the last conference of parties uh, that was held in glasgow one of our uh, winners of the uh, uh, event there was our own uh, vinisha umashankar who spoke about the fact that as is happening this week all the heads of state and all the 180 plus countries are getting together and speak about the future the only thing she underlined is we are the future so i guess on climate change there is no pause button and there's something that we need to all act upon so that's where sustainability largely came about the triple bottom line the definition that we spoke about and that's how this talk talked about that aspect of it in the 2000s and the 2010s uh, largely and i think you're aware of the uh, other thing that happened the millennium developmental goals that was generated somewhere in rio in the 2000 where it largely focused on eliminating poverty and began with the social causes uh, corporate philanthropy and employ volunteerism was basically focused to align on the social issues and that's where this was the hot topic and the mdgs as you are aware progressed on to evolve into the 17 sdgs which begins with poverty and hunger but also goes in to address holistically all the other elements of what we call of esg so as it evolved in 2020 uh, this term esg was actually coined in a landmark study uh, who cares to win by the un global compact in 2005 and uh, this term is used to measure holistic uh, performance of an organization on all the triple bottom lines so while all the roads uh, lead to the same uh, place uh, this again helps you understand what is it and the evolution of esg as we understand there yeah uh, again there was the conference of party again 21 and that began some time ago in paris which legally binds uh, 196 nations that happened 2015 to uh, sign a treaty and uh, which is what is 
the constant uh, reminder that we need to do so much more to address climate change here. So friends, uh, the state of ESG, uh, this is an interesting discussion here because this talks about very, uh, very clearly uh, the entire journey of ESG was investor driven. This is where it all began. And it all, you can see the investor sentiment, uh, how a lot of the investors, the respondents globally, are considered ESG in their investment approach. So this is where the entire journey began from the uh, point of view of the financial elements there. And I guess as we progress, a lot of changes and a lot of, a lot of kind of further generation of, a lot of focus there has come in there. And uh, the, co the focus in the, this COP27 at Egypt uh, with 106 countries attending this week is, is happily to hear that there is a lot of focus on climate finance for the countries in the global south. And that's where the journey has kind of taken on. Each country has identified various regulations on ESG, looking at ratings. And this is how the state of ESG has largely been driven by regulations and more so the investment. And that is why uh, there's been a lot of change there. Uh, the SEC in the US uh, is the corporate uh, sustainability, with the corporate sustainability directive and other regulators. They are the people who drove the ESG compliance in the West. and. Uh, the job of the US, of the SEC, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission in the US, is to enforce federal laws to protect the investors and also to regulate the securities market. The SEC, incidentally, for a very interesting thing, also proposed a rule to curb greenwashing. For the last few years, and this is a question that must be at the top of the mind of many of you, is it all about you know making a nice, profitable book, publishing an ESG report? Is that what it is? Is that what it amounts to? I guess there's been an interesting change there where uh, for the as a first case, uh, uh, BNY Mellon has been fined $1.5 million as penalty for greenwashing. And I guess that's a very interesting uh, journey there. And I think you can see that this is beginning a trend of uh, people asking questions. It is not as if when you publish information in the domain where you did disclosure, there weren't people asking questions, but now it's become, it's also been uh, uh, enacted through a rule there. And that's why I think what you, Disclose is also importantly something that we need to stand up quite to. So that's the other important changes that's happened across the uh, uh, across the regions there. Right. So what are we next? Uh, so the overall global legislative landscape, and we need to understand the global perspective because this is where it all began. Like I said, the ACC and how this entire journey went across the Europe and how the task force on climate related disclosures came up strong, how in Europe, this became part of the taxonomy and how in South America, in a lot of countries there, ESG reporting has become slowly mandatory with the rules and the regulators coming in there, also being part of Africa, South Africa by the Jonasburg Stock Exchange listing requirement in 2010 has made this uh, part of the uh, overall expectations there. We'll talk a little bit about Asia Pacific specifically, that's the audience here. And that's the Asian taxonomy uh, for the uh, China and Europe and also the sustainable finance disclosures. You're aware of what's happening in India. We'll deep dive into that because it's, that's more of interest to a lot of us about the SEBI and the game-changing ways of uh, making business responsible and sustainability as a framework that is mandatory here. So this friends is the overall uh, regulatory landscape across the globe and specifically down to, let's get down to the ESG, the APAC and the Middle East. Uh, so the Middle East has actually, and you know, GRI and all these indicate all these uh, standards were voluntary, but in some parts of the world, like in the Middle East, they have mandated ESG reporting there, uh, including some parts of Saudi Arabia, Qatar. All of these have also made it slightly more uh, important, imperative for organizations to report on ESG here. Closer home in Southeast Asia, Hong Kong uh, listed rules and disclosures on the financial information, uh, including Pakistan, the Philippines Corporate Social Responsibility Act, and Singapore also has made uh, a carbon uh, disclosure, the ESG disclosure requirement for the ESG registered companies. It may be late in the day, but all the world is waking up to disclosures. And even in Australia, New Zealand, where the uh, the the uh, NGER uh, propagated in 2007, and the Climate Act has been done last year. This year has made reporting uh, you know top of the mind here. Uh, in India, of course, there is the SEBI that's come up with the BRS framework, and there's a clarion call for all of us in India. Uh, and I guess this is very critical here to understand. And you see this graph out here. Uh, this, of course, you're aware of the reason why 
everyone is talking uh, ESG and why climate change is top of the mind, because there's various scenarios from the Paris target of holding the temperatures to below the industrial revolution levels that the two degrees uh, increase. So each of these has scenarios that uh, go across here from the world to the other countries, the OECD, the Organization of Economic Development, uh, Cooperation and Development, and all the countries there. And each of these have various uh, you know, ways you might uh, measure uh, various strategies towards climate change and mitigation thereof, uh, be it mitigation, be it adaptation. Those are the efforts that uh, people are doing here. Having said that, uh, all these are logical, but each of these has a significance here because the way that we make our efforts, be it business as usual, uh, be it do it in a strong manner or do it aggressively, in any case, uh, the temperatures are going to go beyond the expected level. So we are reached a tipping point, friends, and which is why, uh, and although you might be aware that most of the greenhouse gas emissions are because of uh, what's been uh, caused since the industrial revolution, that is since uh, the 1750s, and that's the time when most industries were in Europe and the developed uh, developed countries there. So all the emissions that causing all, uh, all this heat is something that happened that many years ago, 200 plus years ago, when the developing countries weren't into any kind of uh, activities there. And they always say the price is paid by the polluter. Uh, but again here, that's why the sanctions largely were on the developed countries. But last year, we were in the Conference of Parties, we took a target of uh, net neutrality of 2070. So by 2070, India has taken a target there. And with a focused effort, uh, I think they all are working together. The SEBI has mandated uh, the reporting of uh, the BRSR, the Business Responsibility Sustainable Reporting for the top 1,000 listed companies. And also there's an effort across the essential and the leadership disclosures to engage more of the MSMEs, more industries there. So in a sense, it's not just the top thousand to begin, just to begin with, uh, the uh, news is slowly tightening as they say. And with this target being taken, a lot of the public sector units and other industries are being approached to take targets for net carbon neutrality. And this again is something that is very critical for us, given that uh, uh, we have uh, a way to go in some industries there. And the state of EAG reporting in some parts of India would not be as evolved, not as mature. Uh, having said that, uh, the uh, SEBI, uh, the Securities and Exchange Board of India, has mandated this. And over the next uh, six months, there are some very interesting developments you can be sure here. And I guess there's a lot of uh, private sector participation. And in the COP26, a lot of targets taken on going green, et cetera. So this is where the uh, question, the bottom line is, ESG is here and very relevant. It is not, it is not optional anymore. It's mandatory here. So that's where this comes throughout here. Okay. So that's where the uh, effect is here. So I guess it's also a priority, uh, a strategic priority in the Middle East, as they say here. And in the uh, UAE stock exchange, like we said, they have mandated the uh, uh, publishing of reports based on the GRI, which is a first, I would say, across the globe. Uh, and I guess a lot of uh, this here has to do with ESG data, with industries uh, looking at their confidence in industries is based on a lot of the disclosures there. So based on the industry's confidence in that, uh, the businesses are well positioned to succeed better and the ESG effects on financial performance therefore will be better insulated. So I guess the fact that the investors are adding in, in ESGs and sustainable factors in investing, and there's also rating agencies that come up and some of the investors feed on the ESG rating agents to get the information from to mine the data. This is where all this happens. So this is the entire uh, you know, uh, global scenario. And that's why in the strategic uh, region in the Middle East, uh, which had a great uh, target on renewables, uh, this again has come in very, very essentially out here. So also as uh, you mentioned here, the, uh, the Islamic investment and sustainable investments also are both considered uh, by high net worth investors in the Middle East, which also is a very interesting development there. So ESG, of course, as you will be well aware, uh, is affected by the financial performance, right? The various reasons uh, and how EAG can be affected there by the uh, consumer demand, it also helps with shaping culture overall. We're talking of uh, change balance about culture. It's also about regulations as we began this journey, it all began with you know meeting regulations somewhere then, going beyond is where sustainability came in in the next uh, the 1990s. Uh, there's a lot of the investments uh, who kind of uh, are having access to capital, uh, to have high value for the equity investors and a lower risk of default thereof. So the confidence of the investors also tells us 
that if anybody look at the ESG ratings, if you want to invest, I think the companies that have a better chance of success are the companies that would not have business continuity issues. And therefore, this all adds up to a nice, uh, beautiful mix out here. So there are many uh, similar strategic uh, sustainability priorities in the Southeast Asia also, uh, be it Malaysia, uh, Thailand, Singapore spoke about that, and Australia, New Zealand, where I think the question that normally comes in here is, are you really invest, uh, interested in sustainable investing has interesting answers there, right? And there's a yes and a no, and I can even see that the greens uh, definitely outvalue the rest here. So you see out here that ESG has, you know, beyond the, uh, what we spoke about, the brand image, right? it protects the reputational risk. It attracts not only the investor, but also the employees to the table here. And it ensures business continuity and uh, offers competitive advantage. In, in a sense, it gives us stakeholder satisfaction and delight. So that's where ESG again is something that uh, is come to stay out here. So like we mentioned here, uh, ESG does create value. The why of ESG, offering growth opportunities, attracts more customers or get better access to resources, uh, also works well in an inclusive manner, building stronger communities, ensuring government relationships who are the key stakeholder, you could say. Uh, sometimes a lot of people feel ESG uh, is a cost but I guess ESG also results in cost reduction. In the pandemic, a lot of companies looked at cost optimization and a lot of layoffs and resource uh, cuts were there. But when you look at this is the place where we, a lot of people thought it's the right time to begin an ESG journey there. So ESG also helps in increasing the efficiency, the operational efficiency. It tracks metrics like uh, the operational metrics. So actually, when you look at environmental parameters, these are actually operational metrics like material usage, raw, finished, energy, water consumption, uh, how you reduce the water consumption, waste, waste transport costs, how you can manage the risks of continuity by being an industry that uh, is sustainable from the environmental pillars also adds up to the ultimate bottom line of profit. So therefore, it's also a cost reduction opportunity there. And of course, the employee productivity and retention uh, and it also ensures that when you an employee looks at joining a company, it doesn't look like just the annual report. We'd like to see a holistic uh, performance as reflected in the ESG report. And that's how investments also would increase here. So ESG does create value, friends. And there are a lot of questions that some of you in the ESG domain would be asked. And the CXOs uh, would also need to respond to a lot of questions, a lot of requests there, be it investors, be it partners, even for qualification and projects there. And across the entire, what you see out here, there are rating agencies and ESG disclosure requests. They come in from across the globe. Business analysts ask a lot of questions. And for that reason, it's very essential and imperative that we get our ESG act in place here. Sometimes a lot of us, and we'll talk about this in the next few uh, minutes, unstructured ESG data might be available. There's something that you might be doing, but that leads to incomplete disclosures. And therefore, the climate risk information is inconsistent. And that's what's come up in a recent research. But this is where we need to ensure that we are also uh, proactively listening to what can happen and building a journey that will take us beyond there. So let's look at the ESG pillars, Fred, because this is all about uh, demystifying ESG for all of us. So we'll deep dive into each pillar one by one. In the next uh, three sessions, we're going to take each of them in detail. So if you've got some questions around uh, more of these, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat box, but rest assured that we'll address them in the next masterclass here. So the E in ESG is the environmental, like I said, the operational part of it. And each of these is connected with a sustainable developmental goal, like we said, as we speak, this one is directly connected to seven and 13, climate action, of course, largely what it talks about. We understood the material issues, friends, and we spoke about that. You can see that uh, the black, the black, uh, the line out here also shows that as we identify material issues, uh, the emerging risks are reduced. So in a sense, they always speak about uh, you know uh, the lead indicators. The more of the lead indicators you build, and as we're talking about the foundation goes to ESG, the more of the material issues you identify, address in a holistic manner, uh, the better you'll be managing your risks there. And the risk could be anything from ESG, from people, uh, from health and environment and safety, and of course managing the operations and also the finances. So it's about business continuity, and that's how we can see that this particular thing also tells us that companies are increasingly recognizing that climate change is a big material issue. In some of the companies, uh, we realize that when they go in for a TCFD disclosure, they realize that when they do an enterprise risk map, they might not possibly consider climate risk, right? In some ways, in some other dimensions, they might look at supply chain risks, et cetera. 
And again, like in 2018, 19, uh, and 20 also, people didn't realize the risk of the pandemic as a major black swan event and a disruptor. But this is where climate, issue, climate change is definitely to become a material issue that needs to be addressed today here. Uh, so then these icons are self-explanatory. Uh, the environmental uh, factors there, emissions, carbon dioxide, all of it is measured as a basis in carbon dioxide in tons CO2 or megatons, metric tons CO2, which is the basis that's taken. Uh, and of course, waste, biodiversity, a flora and fauna, water and effluents, environmental compliance thereof, and of course, energy. These are some of the environmental facets that uh, are important to realize in ESG. <clears throat> So greenhouse gas emissions, you're aware of what this is, and you know that we spoke about the earth reaching a tipping point on emissions thereof, because what began in 1750 has taken global proportions. Uh, there's the seawater levels rising, the icebergs are melting, some of the islands like Barbados perhaps by next year, my, my next few years might just be underwater. And of course the temperatures are rising, the wind patterns globally is changing there. So again, a small interesting, for whichever the industry you are in, uh, there is a nice interesting stat on the global emissions by sector and each of these has an intensity of where it comes from here based on the industry. But the primary sources of uh, JG comes in from industry, uh, production of electricity, also agriculture, livestock. So it's not as if it's just about what we do. They say that it's all anthropogenic, human and man-made, but it's also about people, livestock also. Transportation, of course, is a big guzzler. Commercial, residential, and land use and forestry also results in a plus minus carbon sink. A carbon sink is the abatement of carbon that you might do. Typically, an example of a carbon sink is uh, like they say, typically you plant trees. So planting trees normally take in uh, carbon dioxide and let out oxygen, which is an example of a carbon sink or how you would abate carbon here. And each of these has a different uh, global warming potential. So the lifetime of emissions, uh, again, from carbon dioxide is the basis we've taken. To the other uh, GHG uh, gases, nitrous oxide, methane, and some of the fluorinated gases like uh, PFCs, SF6, uh, NF3, and HFCs have a higher uh, global warming potential. So like we said, these are the ones that contribute to the uh, global warming. And these are the ones that we need to be aware of. And how can we across the industry understand where we are? And the journey begins by starting a journey of uh, understanding the baseline. And we'll talk about how we measure this and what's the approach here. So to demystify this in a simple manner, we'll, dig, we'll dive deep into this in the next session here. But scope one emissions are the ones that happens within your purview, within your boundary, within your control, within your operations. Okay, So that's the one that happens. It could be uh, uh, you know vehicles that apply within your facility. It could be stationary combustion. It could be mobile combustions. All that fossil fuels that you burn within a facility it could be lawnmower, could be DG set. All that is what goes into scope one emissions. Scope two is the direct result of bought out electricity or company purchases like electricity and also purchased steam and heat. And that's how you would see the impact and implication of scope one and scope two. Scope one and scope two is normally what we'd say is what's easily controllable and what's normally mandated is to measure scope one and scope two. What is normally missed out, and we'll talk about this in greater detail later, is the corporate value chain across the value chain. And this is an interesting one that speaks about all the GG gases that's generated by the scope three, that is both the direct and the indirect and the direct, all the inbound and outbound logistics that comes in, and which is why some of the uh, uh, incoming and outbound materials, including employee travel, et cetera, so commute, et cetera, all these need to be captured, the kind of route of transport, the method, the mode of transport, uh, where you're getting your goods from, the purchase goods services, uh, upstream and downstream, each of these needs to be captured there. And in some ways, you've got to be, a lot of people worry about uh, how they can control the suppliers, the value chain, uh, and the vendors, the transporters, uh, because they don't have direct control on them. But this is where it's important to begin the journey of the raising the expectations on identifying the emissions thereof. Uh, because unless you measure what your scope three is, you'll not know how intense that is. And sometimes the material intensive industry, this could be the game changer there. And if you don't focus on scope three, you're not doing much to reduce the carbon uh, footprint overall. So these are the ones that normally look at it. So what's incoming, inbound and outbound, largely that's what this takes uh, scope of, scope three. And this is important to also address. So scope three, like we said, might represent the largest uh, scopes of a company's emission and also provides a significant opportunity there here. So coming down to, I would say the most important parameter, and this is, the S of ESG, S also factors safety, but it's also about health and safety, also about social. And the social factors, these dimensions in the ultimate triple bottom line, let's say, 
like they say, this is the occupational health and safety of the people. You can't do a business harming people or the community. Uh, diversity, equal opportunity, rights, employment, social network compliance, training, education, customer satisfaction, and of course, living in a community. A lot of the industries that set shop uh, a couple of decades ago now have neighborhoods coming outside, coming outside them. And I guess that's the time for them to also look at the impact on the community. But largely, more than just CSR, this is a social factor that is so critical out here. Uh, some of the uh, occupational health and safety metrics. The reason we call this out is because it's all about people, right? Uh, you can't do a business harming people there. So it all begins with people. And that's the reason why you need to look at uh, uh, the safety of the people, because these are the ones that's, uh, I mean, all the uh, aspects of social, it's integrated in the fact that it's all about people there. So the lead and lag indicator to look at out here are the ones that you normally measure, uh, but that's the one that you need normally look at, employee health and well-being. So this is the most critical uh, fact. It all begins, and like I said, it all began with EHS regulatory compliance on environment and uh, people. This is where it all began here. Uh, so how does this all get into the ESG domain? And that's where the ESG, uh, the social kind of embeds well, and it's integral, like I said, the health and safety KPIs are integral to sustainability and ESG, which is the reason why we're calling it out specifically here. And health and employee well-being is important there. Human rights, would say, is a hygiene factor, but also we important to look at the aspects there. So we spoke about the uh, various uh, pillars of ESNG and what goes below that, but you can say that health and safety are the ones that go in here. Uh, the areas of importance also, I think you can see the investors also have uh, a key uh, focus here. Uh, the areas of importance to potential uh, investors on a scale of uh, 1 to 10 also show that this is a critical aspect there. Normally, in uh, reporting, in disclosures, uh, a lot of companies focus on the environmental, which is fine, which is where uh, a lot of the effort also is spent. But you also realize that it's the uh, this is the ultimate bottom line, as you would say out here. Okay, 70% uh, uh, of sustainability keep ESG, ESG KPIs are driven by health and safety priorities uh, on performance there. So like I said, it goes beyond human rights because human rights is something that's a given there and need to respect human rights is something like we said that came up, uh, but all the key stakeholders and individuals uh, need to uphold human rights. Every, every human has rights. And this is again, something that is a no brainer there. And this is the impact on business and the right to life, the right to health and the freedom from slavery, forced labor. All these are critical and imperative aspects to ensure that we get ESG right here. Uh, on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So diversity is not just about gender. It's about uh, the diversity in ages, in races, ethnicities, abilities, or otherwise, regions, cultures, and not just uh, sex, but sexual orientation. These are the ones that uh, come in there. Multiple identities always makes an organization a stronger and better place here, where everyone has a voice. Equity, you must have heard the term equity. Uh, we heard of the vaccine equity uh, that was bandied about a couple of years ago, where uh, the uh, again the uh, rich nations kind of got all the vaccines. India, of course, managed to make its own vaccine, but in two years, all the scientists got together. But the third world countries still haven't got their quota of vaccines, while we got multiple doses, including boosters. So constant, the the, const, uh, the constantly and consistently recognizing and redistributing power is what uh, equity is all about. And inclusive is about thoughts, ideas, the perspective of individuals matter there. You can also see there, there is uh, some of the SDGs that is relevant to DNI and &E &E organizations that's uh, identified for you, that's called out here. So all these helps in belonging. An organization that uh, engages the full potential of people, uh, that's where, where innovation thrives, where views, beliefs, and values are integrated in the organization's DNA. Those are the ones that will sustain longer. So that's why they say that inclusive culture is the foundation of diverse organizations. And that's where this is so critical here, building DNA into the processes. Uh, and I guess it's not just about an HR recruiting process, but goes beyond the way that we manage teams out here. Okay. So that's the S friends uh, to take a few minutes on the governance, the G in ESG. And that is also, I think, I think it all begins with a business to stay in business uh, needs to ensure the governance goes well and also the profitability stays alive. The business of business is ultimately business. So the governance pillar refers to the governance variables in decision making out here. And this is where they say, this is, like I said, it's all about leadership in the words of Masek Mai. So the governance uh, practices include uh, consistent policies, getting an approach right. Uh, and normally the leadership uh, defines the approach. Like we said, in EAG, it's all about inclusive, the way that you create a shared vision, the way you create a policy also needs to be done by engaging all the stakeholders. And that's a better way to deploy them. 
to define a clear, clear process to manage the ESG risk and opportunities, and of course, have a good structure and mechanism of governance there. So this is the way that, uh, and you can see that the board now, uh, the ESG topics, they might not have been an ESG or a sustainability steering committee or a board committee in the past few years, but across this decade, you've seen that come to become to be mandated there. In a lot of the disclosures, especially in countries like India, et cetera, also, this is now coming into be there here. So I guess governance factors, largely, you know what this is. Uh, you might think that it's simple, but the code of business ethics, integrity, compliance, the way you do your business, a responsibility tech, looking at cybersecurity, uh, includes the governance, uh, again, begins the governance. So diversity inclusion goes back to the board. Uh, the risk management is all about managing the risks, right? Of course, the salaries and the stakeholder engagement and rights also plays a big part in one of the governance factors there. A lot of uh, board thinking is about purpose and creating shareholder value, and uh, companies are clearly defining their purpose. Now, what is the purpose there, friends? We spoke about the triple bottom line. What is that? The ultimate bottom line is a profit of prosperity. Uh, of course, the people, the most critical one, and the planet, which you can't harm. Uh, we got to kind of make two. But all these, and a lot of people would uh, go ahead in the journey of ESG, you know, they would begin and do things here. But it's very important, and the triple bottom line also needs to be reinforced by the quadruple bottom line. The fourth P is the purpose. So companies need to define the purpose, and that's the very way that you will get this integrated, because without an overarching purpose there, uh, all the other initiatives will not sustain there. So boards now are focusing on long-term sustainable value creation, just moving beyond shareholder primacy. And that's the focus that's getting there. It's also getting linked to executive pay. And you can see a lot of companies, Google and others, are making this, you know, connecting it very well out here. And I guess you can see that uh, the, uh, the polls, the kind of surveys there being done on the board say that they strongly agree that a strong ESG performance is a key contributor to creating organizational value and a stronger financial performance. So friends, it all adds up very, very well out here. So there are essential steps in building an ESG program, friends. And the first step, we spoke about the management of change and we understood materialities. What is materiality, friends? The first step would be to conduct a materiality assessment to understand what's your, you know, where do you start with? What's most critical for you? So what's materiality, friends? We spoke about risk and opportunities that come in from the stakeholders' expectations. It's about the influence on the stakeholders and the impact, uh, the significance of the impact internally. So it's not just looking inside out, but also looking outside in. So materiality, friends, is of the potential of an issue to impact the operation success and the importance among stakeholders is what it does. And this is how you need to, like we said, identify the critical stakeholders internal. It could be the CXO, the managers, employees, and of course, even the contractors, vendors, et cetera, and the external stakeholders, the customers, consumers, NGOs, depending on the line of business there. Identify the indicators and also ask them on the rank of importance to each sustainability. You could do it through a you know, survey. It's always good to do a good engagement there. Otherwise, people won't connect with, they, they won't understand what it all stands for. A multi-voting would be one way on a scale of one to five. This is one way you do a survey to get each of the internal and external stakeholders to understand what are the key important factors for each of them. And they would analyze the survey results and determine the material issues important to each stakeholder group and play it back to the leadership and identify the materiality for the company here. The various steps that you need to take and the various frameworks there, and there is uh, uh, some that's integrated there, uh, some that's voluntary uh, so far, and like we mentioned in some parts of the world, some of these also started to become mandatory on sustainability, on climates in particular, and of course the business risks and the overall value that you get with including EAG disclosures. And you need to choose a framework, identify the baseline and choose your framework there. So while there are templates that's also readily available, which is well mapped, it's important to understand which framework you use to establish your baseline here. So this is the best way that you begin with identifying and giving the best value to business here. You also then as step three, need to define your goals uh, to set KPIs, you got to measure, and that's the most important part of it. It could be the climate goals, and that's when you also do target setting once you have the baseline to identify by when, and I think we understood that countries have taken targets. We've taken a 2070 target for GHG emissions and neutrality. How do you ensure that you take your climate goals, your social goals to be an employer of choice, to be a great place to work, and of course, the governance goals. So each of these comes through as step number three to identify your goals and identify what's the priorities. And this is about the third step and the most critical step. And then you kind of get to the last step out here. And this is most important, friends, because it may sound simple to identify the data sources and uh, ensure data collection. But this is key to the entire journey here. And this is where we'd like to also suggest that when you build the foundation, 
also having a good data collection methodology and approach that is standardized to set the rhythm for data collection and to have a good data management program, depending on whatever you are. Even if you are doing a BRSR reporting, you've got to connect it with some of the other frameworks there. If you're doing a GRI, you might be doing the BRSR for the first time this year or might have done a voluntary last year. You need to understand what's the interoperability between the frameworks and continuously analyze and evaluate your ESG data to improve your overall sustainability performance there, right? So there's a lot of uh, ways that you need to manage data collection. In one of the uh, entities I was in, in a construct, I was in the EPC sector, uh, and one of the expectations of all suppliers was to make a net carbon neutral, a neutral path there. And the reason that is so important here, how can you extrapolate your, uh, in, with years, you will also grow, the company would grow, but the manufacturer to grow, and even in construction, you might have a, a business plan. How do you ensure that the carbon footprint or the water footprint, the waste footprint that increases in generation, how do you ensure that you have a plan? How is it that you will generate what you do? So that's where I think there's a lot of challenges associated with the data collection, how you mine data. Uh, sometimes the material assessment and you need to refresh it. It's not something that is frozen in time. You've got to understand you and a couple of companies we just spoke to were not aware, were not familiar with what's the material factors there. So if you don't understand internally or externally, they have it validated, uh, that's a big challenge there. So understanding how you have good data collection processes, how you have also navigate multiple reporting taxonomies, you look at data consistently, and there are some things that is you know held in silos. You've got to break the silos because ESG is one, the best way of getting total stakeholder engagement, including employees, the best platform, the best approach that gets the entire organization together. So these are some of the challenges that comes to with data. And this is, uh, you would, unless you build this in design, uh, I guess you might be doing a journey with one party and then do it internally and then go to the third party. And that's where I think if this data is not appropriately managed there, you'll end up in a lot of confusion there. You can see out here, uh, the uh, ESG focus is pretty good, uh, but the quality and accuracy is what's most critical out here. So in terms of data, there's a lot of expectations you have, how you manage the data. Uh, like I said, uh, even for the people who collect the data, you need to understand who is the personnel uh, responsible for data collection, who monitors, who verifies, who validates, and who signs off. It's almost like building a RASI in the ESG data, right? Who is responsible, who kind of does the work, who's accountable, who signs off, who do you consult, and then who do you inform there? So the, some of the expectations of ESG also, you know, the, the expectations of the data should be relevant, both the internal and external part of it. It should, have, it should be complete. You must take the complete inventory defining your boundaries. It must be consistent. It must be transparent, uh, and I guess it's got to be uh, not only, like I said, external assurance and audit, also internally you have a system of a plan to check act the verification and validation, and of course, accuracy in terms of quantification of all the disclosures there and how well you do the calculations there. So that is very important out here. And a lot of analysts are uh, having the equivalent of emojis there, very difficult to integrate the analysis of companies' growth profit. So in a sense, getting the EEG data collection to the same kind of depth and diligence as you do financial, but that is expectation and data out here. So there is uh, a lot of barriers, like I said, to data, especially when people look at this data disclosures as a tool for driving, uh, you know, uh, driving the ratings and driving decisions people take here. And this is where uh, uh, all of us need to be aware of uh, how we can use these tools there. And some of the, uh, you can see out here, the biggest barriers to change is a lack of digital technology and tools for data collection. So that's coming up right at the top from all surveys there. Obviously, you need to standardize the surveys and measurements, uh, but this is where this comes through here again here. Yeah. So this is the overall context there. Uh, I will also pause to show us some data on how we can navigate this here. Uh, so friends, uh, we'll also pick up the questions in the chat box there, but now we will try and look at how we optimize the digital in a way that works well for us. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you, Shankar. And um, can you confirm if you can see my screen? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I think one, one very interesting uh, fact about this survey and the slide that I think Shankar just spoke about is the target audience here is not EHS and ESG teams, but this was targeted towards the investment manager. And when we asked them, what do they think about the ESG data and, you know, what they told us, uh, again, no surprises here, um, is that the company with investment grade data are rewarded with higher investment. And, you know, the quality um, of the data is something that they still see as a challenge, right? And like Shankar mentioned, the lack of a digital tool or a digital ESG system is something which is 
uh, the greatest barrier um, in, in terms of streamlining the overall ESG journey that Shankar spoke about. And the reason digitalization is quite essential here, uh, especially for ESG is because ESG is cross-functional. Um, yes, a majority of the data will come from EHS, but um, there are a lot of input that will be needed from the other stakeholders in your organization, like your HR team, finance team. And uh, that's the reason you really need a robust tool um, that can allow you to gather these data points, um, ensure that this data is credible, uh, auditable, traceable, and uh, more importantly, this is an outcome of a business process. So with a digital management system like Benchmark, what you can do is, um, you know, it uh, doesn't matter if you have one location or 100 locations across the globe, you can still go out and capture data across the enterprise and ensure that the data is an outcome of a business process rather than just having an Excel sheet or a tool where you go and report data. Um, <clears throat> it also helps from a standardization perspective. So um, depending on where you operate, uh, and uh, how many sectors and industries in geography that you operate in, you can make sure that all the people, they understand uh, the expectations, the requirements, and uh, you can also do an apples to apples comparison between two facilities, two business units, or even look at comparing your ESG performance uh, from, a, from a peer benchmarking perspective. Uh, the other important aspect here is the collaboration and uh, like Shankar spoke about, uh, Scope 3 is something which is getting a lot of popularity now. Uh, even the BRSR, under many of the um, leadership indicators, they are asking for your supply chain information. And that's where you really need to reach out to your supply chain and really understand what is their contribution to your overall ESG impact. And that's where digital can really uh, help you. Uh, from a business intelligence perspective and decision making, again, uh, once you have the data available in a tool, it's very easy for you to apply the, the latest technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning and look at, you know, what are what are those key aspects uh, where the management needs to take an immediate action on. And uh, by virtue of, you know, implementing all these points, uh, the, the operational cost and efficiency is something that comes automatically. And, and that's what our experience has been in the, in the lot of implementation that we've done in the last couple of years. Um, finally, one very important aspect from a digital perspective uh, is again the different frameworks that we spoke about, and um, you know we see uh, 80 to 80 to 85 percent overlap uh, across different frameworks that are available out there. And if you have a tool, um, you can leverage this data. You can port this data into different type of outputs, right? So without having to do a duplicate work, you can use the same information and report on CDP, GRI, SASP, uh, and and now BRSR. Uh, from that perspective. So I think the, the key takeaway and like I think the comment from Word Antics again is uh, digital is something that will stay and um, the investment that has been made in digital from an EHS perspective could be the foundation uh, for also leveraging the same technology to capture the ESG related data. And to talk further about the digital solutions, um, uh, we are today, I think we're working with 100 plus organizations and uh, the way most people are looking at digital uh, is very, very similar to the steps, uh, the roadmap that Shankar spoke about. So uh, you need to have a tool that can help you with, uh, you know, looking at your, you know, materiality. So what is material to your organization? What does your stakeholders and investors really care about? Um, and then look at uh, all those different frameworks that we spoke about and identify the KPIs. Uh, make sure that they are measurable and uh, then look at, you know, uh, establishing your goals and targets and decide where do you want to reach uh, from an ESG perspective. And then more importantly, have a system uh, available that can allow you to operationalize your overall process and engage different internal stakeholders in this process to really improve your overall ESG footprint. And finally, um, you know, look at disclosing this information, uh, making sure that you are able to effectively communicate uh, your impact story uh, to, to the different external stakeholders, the rating and rankers, as well as the different frameworks and regulatory bodies available out there. So I think just to give you a very quick sneak peek about the different ESG tools that are available, I think uh, <clears throat> from a reporting perspective, again, uh, a tool like sustainability reporting here can allow you uh, to have a centralized location wherein you can look at collecting, analyzing uh, the ESG performance and, um, you know, just uh, 
example from an environmental perspective would be if you are reporting on fuel consumption and you would like to you know visualize that information into different type of ghg emission normalizing it you know calculating it and then also look at different type of intensity uh, that you would like to report on and compare yourself uh, you can do that very very easily using a tool like sustainability reporting um, not only that you can also look at uh, further uh, digitalizing your program in terms of for uh, taking uh, very very concentrated uh, projects in terms of reducing your um, water waste energy related footprints as well as take up the social and governance related initiative as well and finally at the end of the day uh, you know with the help of a visual chart like this you can look at comparing uh, your overall you know uh, progress uh, and and see uh, you know how far you have come against the targets that you have taken for yourself so i think um, again uh, just to recap from a digital perspective uh, once you have all the components in place uh, right from the you know looking at your materiality uh, from an assessment perspective to engaging uh, different stakeholders in collecting gathering uh, the different kpis that you have um, you know chosen for yourself and uh, making sure that you are communicating your story your impact story in line with the different disclosures uh, frameworks available out there finally at the end of the day you can have a ready made uh, you know output like this and this one example i'm showing you from a dbrsr perspective wherein all the esg information is again uh, aligned with these nine principles so this is the kind of ready made output that you can get from the system right this is a quick sneak peek i wanted to provide you on this session but uh, in our subsequent sessions we will do a detailed deep dive in all the digital tools that we spoke about and and cover it um, uh, you know from an esng perspective so with that i will hand it over back to you shankar thank you so much chandan for a nice uh, i know the world is uh, focusing on the next big event after the cop 27 and the master class that is this big adelaide uh, india versus england match everyone is looking forward to so friends i'll also quickly take uh, some takeaways and also talk of address some of the questions that's come up there so swapna voluntary or mandatory some of them it began as a voluntary kind of expectation but over time like you spoke about the cc uh, the us and in the middle east the gri plus in india the brsr singapore so some of these are slowly getting mandated yeah and the question whether uh, you can do it in house or to consultants i guess each organization can take that call but it all begins with and you might start with the journey anywhere the steps that we gave is to begin with the capacity building because uh, it depends on total employee engagement and a stakeholder inclusiveness is very critical so it could be done in house or externally there anand the, the maturity of the organization to start a digital journey i guess uh, it uh, you could start any time now now is the time because uh, by the time you take a journey across a couple of years uh, it's always begin best to put up a framework put up a platform a reporting mechanism and ensure the templates are digitized the best time to begin is now Our uh, ESG ratings, uh, Amit. I guess you spoke about Amit Kumar. You spoke about uh, why, but I think we explained that a lot of the parameters that we speak about uh, are what is picked up by rating. They look at, and one of the companies I worked with, they had a very poor ESG rating to begin with, and they didn't even know where it came from. It came from some information in the public domain. So it's not as if you really apply for a rating, get a rating. Some of these, like in India, Crisil and S and P Global globally, among the Stanley etc., pick up information from the public domain and do ratings. And this, all this comes in from the disclosures. So the more of what we do, balanced disclosures helps us there. Uh, Suresh, uh, yes, multiple fatalities. Companies still get reporting, get investments. That's one of the uh, challenges that happens there. In one of the companies I worked with, a uh, nice mature company in reporting. One year we had. Uh, Twin fatalities, and we didn't. We dropped a year in ESG reporting, and the customers came heavily. You know, the investors called up and said, "You have, you are not disclosing there." Although the reason was we had engaged a big initiative to do a transformation there, and the reason why we took a break and focused only on getting health and safety right. But yes, that is one of the challenges there, right, friends? Some of the key uh, takeaways. If address any other questions, uh, Ayush, in the chat box. Otherwise, that I missed, let me know. Otherwise, uh, in the interest of time. Uh, I think I think uh, nothing for you, Shankar. But there is one question that was uh, addressed uh, for Chandan. Uh, so, if quickly, Chandan, you can take this question. Uh, does the ESG reporting of an organization need to be mature to involve or introduce a digital tool for the data capturing, like benchmark? No, absolutely not, Ayush. And uh, like we discussed, there are different tools available. Um, and depending on where you are in your ESG journey, whether you are just looking at 
or starting with your materiality or you are a quite mature organization and looking at you know reporting on science based targets uh, you can pick the right tool for your need yeah thanks a lot chandan and uh, shankar sir there were some questions but i think you have you have covered them already yeah so yeah cool. we can go ahead. so friends uh, uh, the verdict is that the pursuit of financial returns or profits and profitability is not at the expense of esg outcomes so esg is indispensable esg is emerging as the top material issue uh, building a strong esg program is a key for and this is the reason why this foundation course is important for us for strategic success here uh, reporting does come with challenges a lot of question that you asked uh, thanks priti is also under uh, explaining that because we need to begin at some place there and the better the platform the better the framework the better the reporting mechanism uh, the better the uh, quality of data and the engagement of people uh, the better the program will be digital tools can of course enable a smooth esg journey and uh, that's the one reason that uh, we asked and of course uh, i guess this has been a very interesting session for all of us uh, and uh, uh, to prashant the way's last question uh, the targets on emissions yes uh it can be you can take a baseline that begins wherever it does uh and you get projected there of the last two years might not be business as usual years so you might take a year that is business as usual as a baseline and then take on the projections but even to understand the projections and the scale you need do need to have some digital tools support you in the smooth esg journey friends so thank you friends for being such a wonderful audience and be glad that we are able to address some of the questions although it was just one hour Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Abhijit. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and uh, uh, there are. Please do remember, we do have the next four sessions for the ESG Masterclass. Uh, please do attend them. And uh, at the end of it, you will also get your ESG Masterclass certificate. Uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Uh, thank you, and goodbye. Stay well. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.